way from Ephraim. Surely this Jesus was the one to bring God's people salvation. Surely he was the one pictured all across the prophet's hopeful panorama. So they shouted, save us please. They cried, Hosanna, Hosanna. And this Jesus would answer yes to their cry of save us, save us. But not in the way they expected. Not by the violent overthrow predicted by their palmy political propaganda. For the humility of that donkey was nothing compared to the way he would answer their shouts of Hosanna. For the path on which he rode took him not to a throne, but to a court. Not to a place fit for a heavenly king, but to the feet of an earthly lord. It was there, before another crowd, in the hands of Pilate, whom God endowed with the power to answer the shouts rising loud, demanding crucifixion for this man who was so recently avowed as Hosanna by those who had laid down a pathway of both palm branch and personal shroud. It was there that he would show how he would answer both crowds both the Hosanna save us cry and the incessant crucify. For what was missed by each tribe, by those who cried out their Hosanna boast and those who cried that this man should be nailed upon two posts, is that Jesus would say no to neither request. Instead, he would say yes to both. In fact, he would accomplish salvation by such infliction. He would be Hosanna by undergoing crucifixion. He would say yes to cries of love and yes to cries of hate. And for us, it is good news that he answered this way. For we too cry Hosanna. We too need to be saved. But we also cry crucify him. We also are filled with hate. We need to be rescued from our evil, but when goodness comes to us, we take what is good and by our evil, hang it on a cross. But this is how he saves us. This is how he loves us. He answered our cry of need and our cry of hate with one final yes poured out as he cried so that the sin that put him on the cross he paid for as he died and the salvation for which we asked by his yes he supplied. So come lay down your branches and come lift up your palms for the king of our salvation said yes to the night of death so that he could raise the light of dawn. Any of the middle schoolers or high schoolers would like to go with Pastor Josh, he's going to be going over and leading a group over in the youth room. While they're heading out. Does anybody else feel like waiting is the worst? Waiting is the absolute worst. Anybody else? I feel like I have the spiritual uh, gift of finding the worst line possible. Anybody else have that gift? If there is a line that is going to have someone that's paying with cash or a computer that's going to shut down, it's mine. But waiting is so infuriating. If that's waiting for your favorite TV show to come back on or waiting, like I said, to see a line progress or maybe like Pastor Josh who walked off uh, a second ago waiting for his football team to finally win a Super Bowl, <laughs> the 49ers. Pastor Joe, I think you might be in that category as well uh, with his bills. My lightning have won twice in the last five years, so I- I'm feeling pretty good. I'm going to fall off the stage as I'm bragging. <laughs> but waiting is the absolute worst. It's, it, it, it's the worst in shallow things, but it's even worse in the deeper things, the deep things of our heart that we're waiting upon. Things like we're waiting 
for healing, waiting for reconciliation, for that relationship that means so much and yet it feels so out of touch. Waiting for that spouse that we've been waiting on, waiting on the the perfect partner in business or in life, waiting and waiting. Waiting is something that permeates our existence as humans. But it also, for us as followers of Christ, resurrection people, waiting is a part of who we are as we wait for Christ's second coming. Next week, we celebrate his death and resurrection on Easter, and yet we are still in the in-between. We talk about it as the almost, but not yet, because we are waiting for Jesus to come back and to make all things new, where there is no more sickness, where there is no more pain, and all relationships have peace. As I describe that, anybody else feel that yearning? in the waiting, that desire to see that as a reality. But we also, maybe today you have a, a waiting in your own heart. That as I talk about this idea of salvation or the opportunity of experiencing forgiveness in our life, that sounds like something that's so far away that pastors talk about, but it doesn't apply to me because I've messed up, because I'm too broken, because I whatever. And we're left waiting to see what's going to happen. Maybe we're waiting for a loved one to experience that salvation reality. But if I could say the truth, (laughs) we all are enough for Christ. We all have hope in Christ. We're going to talk about that today. But in the waiting, as you're looking through those notes, the first thing is in the waiting, expectations are everything. Have you guys ever noticed in waiting, when you get just the opportunity to take a ticket that says a silly number on it, it just makes it that much better? Anybody else, like the deli line or, I'm getting, I, every day, no one agrees with me on that one. But actually knowing how long you are ahead of yourself, it matters so much. It matters for us as we look to Christ his second coming, but it also matters as we look at this story, this story of Jesus in Israel at a specific time in a specific place. Because Israel, as we come into Palm Sunday, Israel was waiting for their Messiah. They were waiting for their Savior. They were waiting for something that they have been literally, literally been waiting for 400 years. From the last prophet in the Old Testament till Jesus' ministry is 400 years of waiting in silence from God to answer that question of what is next. So in the midst of this waiting, they have 400 years, but it's not just 400 years of just easy sailing. It is 400 years of oppression, 400 years of suffering, 400 years of different empire after empire. But as we lead into Jesus's ministry, the Roman Empire, which is one of the strongest empires the world has ever seen, and they kept that strength, they kept that power by some pretty cruel, harsh realities. And we see that on Good Friday with the cross. But we see in this moment a waiting people that are waiting for a Messiah. But they may have come to this expectation a little bit differently than what came to reality. So let us read from Mark 11. We're going to read through this story. Uh, we're going to, throughout this time together, we're going to see in all four of the Gospels, which are the stories of Jesus, the narrative of Jesus, all four of them have this specific moment, but they highlight different avenues. Just like different people telling a story, we're going to highlight different things. And so we're going to work through it in a little bit of a different way and highlight from each one of these stories a little bit. But from Mark uh, 11, you can look it up um, on your phone or the Bible in front of you, uh, but it'll also be on the screen. Mark 11, verse 1. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage and Bethany, 
at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you. And just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord needs it. And I and will send it back here shortly. They went and found a colt outside in the street, tied at a doorway. As they untied it, some people standing there asked, What are you doing untying that colt? They answered as Jesus had told them to, and the people let them go. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks, cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead of them and those who followed shouted, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the kingdom of our father, David. Hosanna in the highest heavens. Jesus entered the temple or entered Jerusalem and went into the temple courts. He looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the 12. We see in this moment that Israel is looking for an earthly kingdom salvation. They're looking for something that will impact their life. They make the statement, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father, David. And we see in this moment, kind of a little bit of a side, but we see in this, this story, this, this borrowing of the cult, which is just a wonderful picture of obedience, we don't see in this a haggling over price or securities, simply that the Lord needs it and they allow it to go. For us, that's like allowing somebody to borrow your car that you just bought and you haven't even driven it yet. <laughs> Let us be that obedient. But in this moment, so that's my side, in this moment we see a waiting people and they say, Hosanna, save us now. Hosanna, we are in need of saving. And we see in Zechariah this, this royal occasion that has an exact fulfillment of prop prophecy in Zechariah. In Zechariah 9, we see this prophecy. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughters of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. We see humility in Jesus. And yes, the humility matters, but it's also fulfillment of prophecy. And we see people affirming and desiring God to fulfill this expectation. But what they're expecting is this earth, uh, earthly Messiah, this change of power, this, this uh, Israel coming again into David's prosperity and rule. It's a pursuit of political power that will allow me or whoever's God, God's people to rule over others. And if we're honest, isn't that kind of our baseline human instinct <laughs> for us to pursue power, for us to pursue whatever the thing is? And so if I were to see myself in this story, I would be with that category of people of expecting Jesus to bring back a kingdom that makes sense to me. A kingdom of power, a kingdom of influence that will overcome Rome. You want to know why I know I would do that? <laughs> because I fall into that same thing in my own life today. Even though I know what is the next note is that Jesus came to be the world's Messiah. And we see in this moment that this is the height of Jesus' ministry. This is when he is most popular, where everybody is on his side. It's the only time that we see Jesus allow the crowds kind of take him to the next level. It's a unique moment for Jesus. But even there, there's opposition. Even there, 
the Pharisees are crying out. And in Luke 19, 39 through 40, we see the Pharisees crying to Jesus or speaking to Jesus. Teacher, rebuke your disciples. This is one of my favorite statements of Jesus. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. That's our savior. That is worthy of worship. That is worthy of acknowledgement beyond any of us can ever provide. But Jesus, even in the highest moment, had opposition. And then that opposition became increasing throughout the week to the point that pretty much five days later, he went, the crowd, as the video said, went from Hosanna to crucify him. Because they were sick of waiting. And they realized that Jesus wasn't going to provide what they expected. They wanted a Messiah for Israel that would raise them up. But God, or Jesus came to be the world's Messiah. So as we are in Palm Sunday, heading in, through Holy Week into Easter, I want to ask you, what are we hoping Jesus to fill in our own lives? What is it that we are waiting for? What are the expectations that we come to this moment? Because Jesus not only acknowledged and, and saw what was happening he saw the disappointment because of the misunderstanding. Jesus mourned the misunderstanding. In Luke 19, in Luke 19 verse 41, Jesus shows how he mourns and grieves. And as he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, if you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The day will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle and hem you in on every side. They will dash you uh, to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God coming to you. Jesus was aware, and this is a moment of prophecy, because as the, the Pharisees and the leaders of that time were wanting to squelch this movement of Jesus because they didn't want the Romans to overcome them, they wanted to preserve their power as the Pharisees. Seventy years later, it happens anyways. When Rome comes and conquers Jerusalem, destroys the temple, and destroys really the Israelite nation. And Jesus mourns because of this missed opportunity. The missed expectation for themselves. But just as Jesus mourns for them, I think Jesus mourns for ourselves. Because to answer that first question is what are we bringing to Jesus? Sometimes we bring, him, bring to him, at least for myself, Sometimes I think, if I follow Jesus, I'm going to have all the right answers. <laughs> I'm going to be able to take any question and provide an answer that has a nice, neat bow, and I'm going to be win every argument. <laughs> Anybody else with me on that one? Now hear me, I truly, truly believe God's word has the best answers. God's word guides us in the best way to live our life, but God's word does not promise to answer everything or win every argument. Because even Jesus didn't do it. <laughs> he still had the Pharisees who doubted him. And he was incredible in his argument and his wit. <laughs> and even he didn't win every argument. So we come to it in that reality. Sometimes we come to Jesus with this idea that God's going to provide us, if we follow him and we're obedient to him, he's going to provide us some level of prosperity. We think... Maybe subcontext or out loud, we think that if we follow Jesus, as the phrase go, he's going to make us happy, wealthy, and wise. <laughs> Anyone else hear that? <laughs> it's 
It's not necessarily what he promises us. Or what about that there's going to be no more sickness, no more brokenness, that life is just going to be easier. Y'all, easy is a weird word because following Christ is not easy in how we understand it. Sometimes God calls us to incredibly hard things. And yet in the midst of that hard moment, if we are living in obedience, it becomes easy. Does anyone, can anyone testify to that easy, hard reality? When you know you're in the midst of that moment and it is so hard, but because of your dependence on Christ, it becomes easy. It's counterintuitive and yet it is so true. Or maybe we come to this moment as we're going to talk about actually next week and for a few weeks later. Maybe we think if we follow Christ and, and live for him as much as possible that we will not have doubt. Hear me, that's not promised anywhere in the scriptures that we will not doubt. We're going to process even next week as, as we go into Easter of what do we do with doubt when it comes up in our heart. Because hear me, when we read this story, it's actually full of doubt. <laughs> On Good Friday, no one was expecting Easter Sunday. Even Easter Sunday, the only ones that were actually expecting really anything were maybe the ladies, but most likely they were probably just going to do their duty to Jesus. <laughs> Once again, that's next week's message. But we are never promised that we will not have any doubt. So what did Jesus come for? <laughs> What is it that Jesus came on a mission to this world for? And it is simply this. Jesus came to bring light into the darkness. We see in John, as he tells this story immediately after the tri tri uh, triumphal entry, the Palm Sunday reality, we see Jesus describe some things. He goes through and we see this big moment and then Jesus predicts his death to the disciples and then he talks to the followers of Christ about what does it mean to believe in unbelief of the Jews and what does that mean? And then he immediately follows with this really succinct or short description on why Jesus actually came. And it's Matthew, or John 12, verse 44. Then Jesus cried out, whoever believes in me does not believe in me only, but in the one who sent me. The one who calls or the one who looks at me is seeing the one who sent me. I have come into the world as a light so that no one who believes in me should stay in darkness. If anyone hears my words but does not keep them, I do not judge that person. For I did not come to judge the world but to save the world. There is a judge for the one who rejects me and does not accept my words. The very words I have spoken will condemn them at the last day. For I did not speak on my own, but the Father sent me, commanded me to say all that I have spoken." I know that his command leads to eternal life. So whatever I say is just what the Father has told me to say. Jesus came to bring light into the darkness. And in this declaration, when so often we want to zoom in into the individual, Jesus is zooming out in the fact that he is not only bringing light to the Jewish people, he is not only bringing light to those who follow him, he is bringing light so that no one should stay in darkness. No one to stay in darkness. That means no one in Spring Hill, Florida, stay in darkness. Jesus has done everything that is necessary for all of humanity to experience his light. Isn't that incredible? He has done it all. Not only has he done all the work, but he has the desire that all should experience his light. 
I've, I've been in, a, in an increasing way, been able to see the darkness that is in our community. And I don't mean, I'm not trying to be negative or rag on our community, but simply, I would say that our community is pretty indicative or regular in comparison to Central Florida and most others. So I'm not being negative. But the truth is that there is a darkness that exists in Hernando County. There is a darkness as you drive down Spring Hill Drive. There is a hopelessness as you go down 19. Does anybody else feel it? But God's hope, Jesus' hope, is that no one will stay in darkness. No one remain without hope. And yet, as we see in our community time and time again, it can be a place of darkness instead of light. But hear me, that is the hope, that is the calling of Fellowship Community Church to see that mission that all may know the light of our Savior. Because he is the only hope that we have. And hear me, it's happening. It may not be to the degree any of us would hope, but yet God is working in our midst. In the last two weeks, we have seen six people baptized in our jail ministry, just in the last two weeks. A very dark place. And there is light. And there's other churches uh, serving there as well. Our food pantry served 60 people, which is an amazing thing for us to provide food. But even better, once again, someone accepted Christ because of our food pantry. That's what we're doing. That's exactly. Come on. It's bringing light to our community. And hear me. This is a humbling truth from a pastor. Fellowship Community Church will not provide the light to our entire county. We can't do it. But we have been partnered with so many churches, and a perfect example is MCS 21, which is the church that meets in the afternoon, a fellow Wesleyan church. They are baptizing 21 people this afternoon. Come on. Pastor Karen and Jacob are doing amazing things. We want to celebrate. There are churches all over our county that are desiring to see the light. But hear me, in the midst of the darkness, we need each other. Because it it really is in gradients. Because right now, this may be viewed as a place of darkness or without hope. But as the church, as Christians come and bring the light of Christ, each one person at a time, we might be able to see the community change. Where we see this be a place that's known for grace. Known for peace. Known for hope and love where the church is a cornerstone component to not only gather, but to change our community in the light of Christ. That is literally why we exist and the hope that we have as a church. And so for us, I just want to, just an opportunity to be a little bit better because once again, I'm a forgetful pastor and sometimes I forget to celebrate what God is doing because what is happening in this room on Sunday morning matters exponentially. But so does the ministries that happen outside. Throughout the week, God is working in different ministries. And so a way for us to show that God is moving is if there is someone that takes a step in baptism or salvation or takes some step towards Christ throughout the week, we're going to begin to light these candles. And they're going to be somewhere over there. I'm not sure if it's been approved to actually put them on the piano because it'll probably hurt something. I don't know. But they'll be over there somewhere. But here's the truth. Let us be a community that is constantly expecting to see more of Christ's light in our community. Expecting to see these candles lit every single week. Wouldn't that be awesome? (laughs) Let us be those people who one at a time be able to cry that cry of Jesus. No one stay in their darkness. Now, we can have a whole conversation about free will and ultimately is their choice, but we can set the table where the gospel is saturated so much that on an annual basis, every person in our county has some way seen the gospel. We can see this place changed. 
we could see this place as a place of light and hope. Now, you once again, maybe in this moment, think, ah, it's nice, Pastor Todd. Hope and light and grace, that sounds awesome. But not me. I can't experience that. Sometimes it's because of our past or because we just feel like we can't do this Christian thing right or whatever the thing may be. But here's the truth. Romans tells us that we all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We all are worthless in our own actions. No matter how good we've been or how bad we've been, we are all worthless in the view of God. We are all utterly and totally dependent on his grace. And so today, if you have never taken that step of salvation, you've never said, Jesus, I'm all with you. It's so simple. Romans 10, 9 through 10, or 9 through 10 tells us, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Amen. It is just that simple. Sometimes we make things so complicated in the church, and I love complicating things, and I apologize for that. be this. Maybe unlike the light up here. <laughs> it's back. Here we go. Maybe you've had a season where you've been focused a lot more on the dark than the light here for a hot minute. And hear me, we've all had those seasons. Salvation is a journey, it is not a moment. It is about continuing in a direction. Yes, moments matter, decisions matter, but it matters in the direction of our life. You hear me? Because we can get down on ourselves on the valleys, but guess what? God is in the valley with you. God is in the dark place. And if you've ever said any, even the smallest yes to him, he is with you and he loves you and he is one step away from you at all times. Let today be a day of taking a step back into the light. Take a step towards Jesus together. And the third challenge would be, the third opportunity as the worship team comes forward. Maybe you want to partner with or you realize that this is only going to happen if this is a whole community reality. And you want to take that reality for yourself, that I'm going to be a person who brings light into the environments that I exist in. I'm going to bring light into my workplace. I'm going to bring hope into my families. I'm going to bring light into my relationships. Can you hear me? That does not happen on accident. <laughs> it's a journey. But if that is something that you would like to do, there's an opportunity for you to respond. And so today, as we lead into this last song, if you have accepted Christ and you desire to take that first step for the first time or just another step in that journey of salvation, I encourage you to come forward and light a candle. Simply light a candle and leave it at the altar. There's also candles in the back and tables that you can leave them back there. But the truth is, if today you want to take that step and declare that you desire to see that light in your life, simply light it. But if you are also in that moment of that truth that you have experienced that light and that hope, and you want to be a part of sharing that in our community, be a part of sharing that in your families, the same challenge is for you. Come forward as we sing this last song. Light a candle and let us see how bright we can see this community as we come together. Let us worship and respond. There is nothing worth more that will ever come close.